So welcome to Unleashed Learning Radio. And look, if you ever struggle trying to keep up with all the educational technologies that are available, or you're just wanting to figure out what's the kind of technology to use that's gonna help make learning stick for all of your students, uh, we've got a special treat for you today because Dr. Chandler, who's a professor at the Sanford College of Education at National University in San Diego, who is also a colleague and doctoral student friend of mine, is a leader in the field of education technology, and she's here to answer your questions. So, Cynthia, welcome. Thank you, William. I'm just delighted to be here. I have had the pleasure of being in your part of the world, uh, but actually was in New Zealand. Um, so I haven't made it to see you yet, but I'm hoping to do that very soon. We'll have a little reunion, a little doctoral reunion. For so, sure. um, you know, when people kept asking us about technology and we do stuff with technology, but I wanted to reach out to an expert in the area. And so the first question I've got is, why are you so passionate about educational technology? Well, it all began in the mid 80s when I was a primary teacher teaching first grade. We were using Apple IIEs, yes, way back then, and had access to programs like the Print Shop and the Children's Writing and Publishing Center, which is a desktop publishing word processor tool. And these tools allowed my students and my parent volunteers, I might add, to create flyers, to write, and to publish. I can really remember the first time my students and uh, use these tools and I watched their writing roll off the image writer printer. It was magic. They were really awestruck that they published their writing and what a, what a, a wonderful accomplishment for them. During the 1990s, uh, so many publishers like Scholastic and Broderbund and others were developing educational software specifically for K-12 education and learners were really engaged by colorful, media-rich screens, and they played, maybe you remember these games, Tetris, yep. and where in the world is Carmen San Diego? Oh. And we had one in, in California called the Oregon Trail, which was created actually by a Minnesota company, and it was a simulation, and, and you, it was just really fun for the students, but they were actually learning. And learning was enhanced by computer technologies and software, and I really realized as an educator that technology showed promise for motivating youngsters. And in my view, it, you know, the power was really in desktop publishing with simple word processors. And youngsters were also turned on to computer applications like logo programming, where remember the turtle that you could make move across yes. the screen? <laughs> kind of the, you know, the precursor to what's happening right now with coding and code.org and other agencies. Um, and in my classroom, we only had one computer. You know, keep in mind, there's, there weren't any uh, classroom sets, no Chromebooks, no one-to-one -one devices, and no internet back in those days. <laughs> but my kids uh, quickly learned to hunt and peck and learned how to navigate around a screen and a keyboard. Another catalyst to fueling my passion was that concurrent to my teaching, I was working on my master's degree in curriculum and instruction. I always thought I was gonna be a textbook writer. Well, when I learned about books on CD-ROM, uh, there was a company called Discus, and then Broderbund had uh, all kinds of uh, active multimedia CD-ROM where the, the characters were talking and there was music and dialogue and just really made those stories come alive. Um, really, it, you know, technology continued to to be sparked by the promise of multimedia instruction. Yep. So during the 90s, I actually took a hiatus from teaching elementary and worked as a curriculum spe specialist working in the software industry. I started writing teacher's guides for software that I, I really was passionate about making sure that teachers were aligning their skills and outcomes to state and national standards. And what this did was helped to justify that the computer was a tool, not a toy. It wasn't a place for rewards. It was really more of a, of a learning device. And Seymour Papert is very strongly associated with that field of thought. Um, and teachers could, could engage learners through interactive lessons and, and projects. Um, and then I've been teaching in, in, at higher education with teacher education ever since. And I could say, you know, really the rest is history. But this was only the beginning of my personal 30 plus year journey and continuing my passion 
to share purposeful and meaningful technology integration strategies with hundreds and thousands of educators throughout California, the US and Canada. And now Australia. <laughs> and, now Australia. And, now, and now Australia, yes. You know, what strikes me is what we're talking about is, and we talk about this at Unleashed Learning, that it's a tool, not a toy. I mean, I don't use the word toy, but I say it's a tool. And it's mm -hmm. the intention behind the tool is what really matters. And so the next question I've got that people ask us all the time is, how do we keep up? So there's all this technology coming at us. And what are some like ways you can recommend that as an educator or educational a leader, we could keep up with the technology if that's even possible. I know it's really a, a daunting challenge, um, particularly as an educational technology professor. I work with a lot of students who, you know, we, we constantly have to look at the emerging trends in, in technology and really look beyond the tool and look at what is the implication for teaching and what is the implication for learning. And the internet really has truly transformed how we learn. And you can ask any young person a question and they will immediately Google it, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then you go, or you can go to YouTube and see the how-to video to teach you how to do it. Uh, well, in 2020, it's never been easier to learn new skills, pedagogy, or practices. And I really believe that the latest and greatest technology tools don't need to be expensive or to be purchased. Um, my advice is to use what you have to access the world. We're in a global world. Um, we have global work teams. You know, uh, William and I are, are collaborating on some projects and really the world is open to all of us. And any phone, even the old flip phones, can take pictures and any laptop or input device can word process. And that really is the power of giving the students the tools to be able to write. So there are um, also, there's so much information out there, but there are vetted educational resources and they're called open educational resources that are free. The OER movement is a worldwide movement that's been supported by the World Bank, that's been supported by the United Nations, and it really gives us free access to so much content and our students access to so much content. We could use free textbooks and educational materials, and we can listen to podcasts and watch educational videos on YouTube, like um, the Khan Academy. And look at what the Khan Academy has done to teaching learners every subject area you can possibly think of. My personal experience, I can say the best way to keep up is to join a professional organization. One like ISTE, which is the International Society for Technology and Education, in Australia, you have the Australian Association for Technology and Education and the Australian Council for Computers and Education. Attend regional and uh, uh, national conferences that feature innovations and best practices that are demonstrated by educators for educators. They're sharing what works in their classroom and sometimes what doesn't work. And you can also participate in webinars on a topic you're interested in. And most of these are free and recorded in case your time zone doesn't allow you to connect in real time. Um, web ed is one of them that I really enjoy. Um, and, you know, finally, there are local groups, um, local birds of a feather groups who are seeking to learn about these emerging and emergent technologies. Um, in California, we actually started uh, getting together informally over coffee. This was a grassroots movement to get educators to get together without a lot of formality. We know a lot of what happens in, in discussion really gets people interested, and it's through that informal conversation that sometimes big ideas uh, em emulate from. So this group uh, in California, we got together for coffee cues. And we met at coffee shops, and eventually, we uh, it even led to brew cues and other just-in-time pop-ups <laughs> to get together to share new tools and to talk about tech issues. So you, I'm sure you can imagine what kinds of conversations we had when we were at these kinds of um, just-in-time pop-up get-togethers. And I can tell you that it has developed uh, personal learning networks across the world of people connecting. And one of the other uh, avenues to keep up, if you're really ready for a wild ride on the internet, you might want to use Twitter for professional development. 
And what you do is you follow a hashtag or an at sign um, by a professional uh, group or even by educators who have branded themselves as experts in a particular area. There's lots going on on coding right now. There's lots going on in, on um, English language development, um, uh, social and emotional learning, and just a plethora of other things. Twitter chats are really quick and crazy, but they are so much fun. So it's all text, no voice, and let your fingers do the talking. That's you really can also, yeah, you can also learn about some of the hottest technologies like augmented reality, virtual reality, and how people are using these tools inexpensively. I mean, Google Cardboard is $5 where you take your smartphone and you place it in and it uses uh, a virtual reality wrap and, uh, uh, to wrap around and the app application actually launches you into a virtual environment. You can walk through the Eiffel Tower, you can walk through pyramids. It's really quite, quite fun. But once again, like I ask my master's students always and, and my contemporaries in, uh, who are in the classroom is, what is the implication for teaching and learning? There's the question, isn't it? I mean, that leads me to the next question, but before I ask that question, Cynthia, one of the things I just want to kind of uh, mark of what you said, because that's a lot what you were talking about, but, and one of the things that struck me is bring stuff to you. So if you get on that newsletter or you follow a group or you get into maybe one a Twitter hashtag that you follow so that, or you go to that conference so you're not reinventing the wheel, you're trying to do it all on your own. So I just want to flag that because there's a lot there, but finding ways, I mean, one of the reasons we do Unleashed Winning TV is to bring stuff to people, right? So that's the reason we do that. So whatever you sign up for is get that information coming to you. So let me exactly. ask you the next thing. So, yeah. sorry. And I just want to note also that there's so much excellent content and there's other content that may not be so, so good, so, so accurate, so vetted. Um, but we are curators. We are learning not only how to harness the power of these resources, but also translate and analyze them and apply them and integrate them into our classroom. So we don't have to do all the work because a lot of it's already been done for us. Which probably gives us all a sigh of relief because we don't want to add even more to our plate. We're trying to streamline this. And that's why the, this is the next question. I think it's really, really important. And we talk a lot about this at Unleashed Learning, but not all technology is the same. And I firsthand have seen where technology can actually you know, decrease engagement or actually create surface level learning. But I've also seen it be used where it helps make learning stick or build community. So I'm wondering how can we use technology to help make learning stick rather than it just being a surface level thing or a toy? Can you give us maybe a little bit of an example of thinking about technology to get learning to stick? Absolutely. You know, you're absolutely right, William, because it's not a one size fits all and it really leads to deep learning and different technologies are more suitable for some learners but really the bottom line is that when the use of technology causes frustration by educators or by students or it impedes the learning process that technology should not be used um, here's a one positive ex example that helps with language learners those students who are not fluent in the primary language of the region um, they greatly could benefit from devices that record like iPods, iPads, and other uh, uh, handheld devices that help the recording of the voice and narrate text in a variety of languages because the more practice these students have in speaking any language, the better uh, that they are, you know, just like an old fashioned tape recorder. These are highly beneficial uh, practices that are enabled by technology. So any kind of recording, a speaking device, uh, text-to-speech helps with a variety of learners. Uh, and there are, you know, just really meaningful use of any kind of technology. But I want to caution educators not to assume that our youth are digital natives. So true. This yeah, this concept is really a myth. And, and, and it started with Mark Prensky and, and a couple of other, John Seely Brown, um, that we, we have to really embrace the fact that just because the latest generation of students does not know a world without the internet or cell phones or Google, 
doesn't mean that they know how to locate vetted information on websites. So important. So important to say this. So important. Sorry to interrupt you, but it's so important. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they don't know about deep learning. They don't know about analyzing information. They don't know how to evaluate or discern information. I mean, think about what fake news has done across the globe and what I don't want to call any particular social media tool out, but Facebook, um, <laughs> how they were pushing uh, certain kinds of news and certain kinds of advertisements. So we really have to be very media literate in, in our society. But using technology um, to type also doesn't always afford the learner to apply good grammar or enhance the writing process. So technology literacy should not be assumed. And there should be some kind of a baseline skill that all um, students need to have. Um, there needs to be a direct instruction, like tutorials or mini lessons to teach the basics. And remember the end goal is to achieve the mastery of the content or be creative and at, uh, provide the student with ample opportunity to publish and to refine their writing skills and whether it's through a blog or it's through other kinds of social media um, or it's simply you know creating a, um, a slideshow book. Um, these are all really super uh, activities to, to help that learning stick. And it's really funny that you refer to making learning stick because we know as academicians and practitioners that learning always occurs when the task and the content are meaningful. So we know the brain associates uh, success um, with, with meaning. And so it's really not the technology, it's the content that's the motivation. When students are passionate about a topic or subject matter, they will dive in to learn all they can, whether it is reading text on a printed page or having a page of text read aloud from a web page or connecting via Skype. There's a Skype in the classroom that is available where you can connect with mentors from around the world or using the phone to Google um, or even taking a MOOC, which is a massive online open course that's free to anyone as Dr. Curtis Bonk would say, the world is open to knowledge. And as educators, our role is to purposely make that happen. I, you know, the two things I wanna say, and we're just almost out of time, but I keep hearing you say, it's just a tool and decide what that tool is for. And the second thing I heard you say is, you know, part of our unleashing system is who students are matters. And you're talking about ways to connect the, who students are with the content. And the other thing I'm thinking about is in our new teacher companion that I'm just flagging people that are taking that program, but we do have a checklist for every kind of technology that you use to see if it's the right tool for you. So I do want to encourage people who are taking that program, mm -hmm. to use mm -hmm. that checklist um, to be thinking about that. So uh, Cynthia, here's our last question. And um, the last question we've got is this, or I've got, is can you share with us one technology that you love that you think really helps learning stick for everyone? Well, I, you know, I believe the key to making learning stick for students is to provide the content in multiple forms. You may be familiar with Universal Design for Learning or UDL, which ascribes to the notion that learners need to take in content in multiple digital formats. And I might also add that they need to produce in multiple formats, whether it's it's doing a production, a play, singing, uh, any kind of performance, any kind of authentic assessment for, um, for showing what they know. And for an example, accessing a digital assignment on uh, a post, a blog post, online video tutorials, and video and written with written spoken directions on a web page. Um, I really encourage teachers to take the jump to open that digital door and construct a document that is in Google Docs or other sites so that the students have multiple means of representation, which really helps solidify that learning that happens in the course of, of the, the day, as well as after school. That's right. And anything equated with multimedia, which is more than one media, graphic, visual, text, auditory, experiential, hands-on, 
All of these are critically important to give students access to education when they're not at school. This will really make learning stick. And as I mentioned before, the Khan Academy really changed the paradigm of instruction by giving learners the choice to watch a video tutorial over and over until mastery learning has occurred. This digital presence of the web and creating web content, uh, like I said, on Google sites or using the Microsoft Office OneDrive and with all of those applications makes a learning available to students 24 seven and make an extension of the classroom. So I believe web 2.0 tools as they're called like Google Docs, Google Slides in con combination with other web by sorry, web based software like <laughs> Zoom, Skype or Google Cam Hangout can help students collaborate to form study groups and work together on problems outside of school. So we want our students really to have access to many of these technology tools in the schools and out of schools when possible so that we can teach students how to collaborate and work together in groups in a face-to-face -face environment or in an online environment. Collaboration, negotiation, speaking, and writing to develop these kinds of life skills. After all, we really want our students to move beyond being consumers of information to, this is my big pet peeve, constructing knowledge and showing what they know using digital based formats. As I mentioned, Google Docs and other types of web 2.0 tools. What do you do when you don't have the internet? Well, you can certainly use paper based materials just as well. Use your maker spaces, construct learning using, you know, using um, found art um, and do role play and simulations in, in face to face communication, but record those processes so that they can be shared again and again and again. So William, thank you so much for the opportunity to share my journey and suggestions for educators with your Unleashed Learning audience. And I do have ways that you can continue the conversation. Um, I, you can follow me on at Cynthia Chandler or read more about my work on, I have a shortened URL name, it's tinyurl.com slash Cynthia Chandler, where I have just a plethora of information about one-to-one uh, -one technology, using screencasting, um, you know, the tools are endless. Flipgrid, all kinds of, of technology tools that can be used in the classroom. Well, what we'll do, Cynthia, is we'll um, put those links into the blog. And I just want to say uh, one last thing about what you just said, and then I've got a question to the audience. But what I heard you say, you know, we talk about lifting the weights. And what I heard you just say is technology is a great way to get students to lift the weights in multiple, dif dip multiple ways to get learning to stick. And the more times they lift the weights in different kinds of ways, that's how it embeds and it's part of them. So that's why, you know, using technology as a tool to get those aims rather than just to consume information. So right. Cynthia, I'm gonna, um, for everyone listening, we've got a question. Cynthia and I, if you're listening, have a question for you. And the question we've got for you is, what is one piece of educational technology that you think all educators should use? Maybe it's a piece of technology that you found great results to help learning stick. So some of the best conversations take place in our comment section of the blog. So we encourage you to go to unleash-learning.com, go to the blog and join the conversation. So Cynthia, I really appreciate this um, being part of Unleashed Learning Radio. Um, we'll put all the links there. Thank you so much for the work you do for the world. We really appreciate your time. Oh, you're welcome. My pleasure. And I look forward to connecting and continuing connect to connect. I have other friends in, in Australia who I've met at the International Society for Technology and Education that's being held in Orange County this year. And they come across the globe to, to join us at that ISTE conference every year. So if you're gonna be in the area, um, please contact me. We have a great network of computer using educators, technology using educators and um, innovators in uh, Southern California. How fun would that be? Well, let's hope it happens. Thanks, Cynthia. All right, thank you again, Dr. Jean.